Man who was very quick in practice this afternoon on the clock now from Sunnyvale, Texas. The Tom Line Variety High Reader Foundation Service Act Limited Insurance Kaiser Aluminum Wheels. Number 15H of Sam Hayfertip Jr. Sam Hayfertip in the 15H, his opening lap time. So on the Drivers Project, we're doing a deal where we're kind of going over like cool moments in sprint car racing history. Uh, one of the ones that I always thought was pretty cool for us personally was when Sam set the track record at Bristol. And we have Sam here with us, and we have Dom here to interrogate him. Uh, welcome to the show, Sam. Yeah, glad to be on. Dom, happy to see you again. I never get to talk to you. Yeah, no shit. Glad to see you again. I, I got, I've got a lot of questions for Sam, actually. I, I know this is probably supposed to be a quick one, but I just have, like, living in Texas, do you have to carry a gun all the time? Or, like, how's that work? Well, you know, we have, we have the... Uh... The, the, lots of gun people down here for sure i mean i don't actually have one i'm probably like uh the odd man out my wife has like a bunch of them and i don't even have one so <laughs> you don't have a gun his mom has a gun and he doesn't <laughs> yeah my mom has a gun i don't i mean fuck, my wife's got like four of them i don't need one I, I used to have a bunch and they all got lost on a fishing expedition they're at the bottom of a lake now Going into Bristol, Sam, what was the status of your team? How had you been kind of running heading into that weekend? Uh, I mean, we just kind of started our 410 venture. Um, so we had, uh, I don't know, I, I felt like we had a lot of speed at big places, which obviously I came running 360s. We were running a lot of small places all the time. So it didn't really make sense to me why we were fast at big places. Um, not that I suck at them, but just that was where we were better at the time. And um, I don't know, like I felt like we were running solid, but uh, we lost a little bit of grip. We weren't very good with the 410 stuff. Um, I would say, like I say, I felt like our motor program was probably as good as it had been, uh, especially starting off so fresh in the 410 deal to have your qualifying speed that good right out of the gate. Like at Volusia, we were quick time. Um, I wouldn't say it's not like people would expect me not to be top of the board qualifying because we've always been pretty good at qualifying. I think it's probably, honestly, uh, a shock that we don't qualify any better than we used to nowadays. Um, and I just think it's a product of the racing. But at the time, I feel like uh, we had a really good qualifying team and just probably couldn't hold our mojo throughout the night. That's how I would describe our team. Heading into Bristol, when you got the invite, we were pretty positive for it. There were some teams that were immediately scared shitless. We were kind of happy. Um, what was your reaction to getting the invite to Bristol? <laughs> well, I mean, in my situation at the time, I felt like for a guy like Miles, for a team like ours in that situation, and like, you know, even like thinking about Alex what what her thought would be is like well you have to go there's no you know it's like oh man that's badass it's bristol you know you gotta go right you know like it's not like a family-owned team where i could just say hey man it's probably not smart that we go like we're not ready to for that or it's like okay well i've got an owner that's spending money and i've got his daughter really likes the thought of us probably going to race this race and i just assume that we had to go, you know, and, and, uh, I, I wasn't, I don't, I wouldn't say I was scared. I was, I would say I was unsure because you hear so many people talk about, Oh, well, you got to have a special this for Bristol and you got to have a special that. And you got to, and I'm thinking like, man, I know Bristol's big and I know it's fast, but if we're in a, on a five Oh gear around that place, it can't be way different than a lot of other places we go. And, Boy, was I wrong. But um, I still felt like being in a situation where I'd never been there before, it gave me a good, I don't know, it gave me a lot of unanswered questions. So I would call like a guy like Forbrook or, you know, I would, you know, talk to a few guys that maybe had been um, just to get a feel, you know, off of people like, you know, a guy like Rick Furkle, you know, like, 
one of the toughest guys I've ever met in my life. Like, oh, there ain't nothing to it, Sammy. You know, it's like, okay, you know, if Rick says that, we, you know, like, even if you are scared, you could, you got to pretend like you're not, you know? So, um, I don't know, like, I felt like that helped us going in tremendously, just having questions to be answered and, you know, at least not for getting there and not knowing a clue. When you got there, you actually got to run a practice session and I remember you calling me and you were terrible. But before we get to that, what were your impressions when you rolled into the place and actually got to see the track? Uh, just the banking is really intimidating, I guess, for, you know, when, when they have to bring a special load of dirt in to get your rig in the, to rig, to, to park your rig. So your rig doesn't bottom out. You know, that's, they don't, we don't have to do that at Eldora. We don't have to do that anywhere. So they literally built a less banking of a ramp just to get your rig into the racetrack. So when your guys are freaking the fuck out about, Hey man, I don't know about going in this place. It's kind of sketchy. And you're like, well, that's just pulling a rig in, man. Like what about me driving the car and, and, and you know, in five, six hours, you know? So, um, the experience of the whole thing, I would, I always say this. I got a call from Carlton Reamers after like a week after, cause we'll probably get to it a little later. And basically the, the experience, like what I try to tell everybody, the experience of doing Bristol is the probably single handedly coolest thing that I've ever done. And obviously the speed that we had, made that obviously part of a cool experience as well but um it was unbelievable there's nothing like it the way you'll never race anything else ever like it and honestly we don't have any business racing that racetrack explain your first practice session explain what that was like and how things went so you know you got there's probably about i would say at the time there's probably 18 of us that were prepared to go out for the first set and I think everybody else that didn't go was just like, well, we're going to watch them dumb bastards first. So, you know, we don't, you know, so we at least know what we're getting into. And I'm like, dude, we need to hit the track as many times as possible, even if I don't pick up a lot of speed or whatever. So the track was pretty slick on practice, like probably slicker than it got the whole weekend. And I want to say we were low 14s was probably the lap time we were turning the beginning of practice. And you're going down the chutes and I couldn't like pick my line of where I wanted to stay. Like, it's not like I was going to go bang off the wall on the outside and then go three lanes low. But if I was trying to run, say down the straight front straightaway wall, I couldn't just keep my car there. I couldn't keep my car right against the car would move. It would do, it would do, crazier things than I've ever felt in a sprint car. And then like, say you're dropping into turn one, you couldn't really dictate, man, I'm going to hit this line. And I always tell people like this, like if we went, went out to practice and you literally tried to drive with a guy side by side into turn one, I don't think one guy there was prepared to try that just because the lack of control of your race car. Now, obviously, this is a lot of guys' first times at Bristol, so I would say that we all got more comfortable throughout the weekend. Like, I think that's what did happen. And I think, obviously, guys' cars got incredibly better, you know, the longer we went there and the longer we made laps around that place. Dom, at this point, I'm sure you're talking to your brother. What's your brother saying? So, I remember because this reminded me a lot of like the 2020 Knoxville like the the first race back with the outlaws and Sam I, I can't remember whether you ran that race or not but um you know I remember there was rumblings about it and then there may have been a text message or a phone call about it and then you know there's a lot of discussion before everything every anything ever gets announced and it was the same thing with this race like you know we got called about it like the year before and uh you know there, there was conversation about it like hey you know we're going to do an invitational race and this that and the other and and I, I immediately like not telling the outlaws but i immediately told my guys no we're not going like don't even consider it i'm not doing it that's not for me 
And at the time, my brother wasn't a full time outlaw, and he's like, "Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we're 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 for sure going." And I remember his first session because he didn't go out early. He went out later in in that first pra- practice day. I remember him telling me, "He goes, I've never felt." so uncontrollable in a race car he's like the car just dances it skates around the racetrack um you know you at that time i think they had four 1025s in it just to see where they were at and they were so locked down that they they didn't really know what to expect so you get through the first practice day how do you end up doing the first night oh i don't i don't can't remember i think it would qualify like fifth or something i i can't remember totally um but it put us on the front row of the heat. I think with Geo, actually, um, I think we I think we won the heat. Um, if I don't think we won the heat, I know we won the heat. Um, we won the heat, um, and the car was. I would I would say the car was was pretty solid. Like I would say, the car was. I mean, it it was drivable. I would put it that way. Whereas the first night, like. If I had to go in and go side by side with somebody into turn one, I I don't know, you know, you know, because like everybody, like, I don't know, even talking to like McFadden with a guy you think's pretty fearless, you know, a guy like him or, you know, other guys like, you know, we're all standing. I kind of want to go back a little bit to kind of explain more of the magnitude of how. I'm not going to say scared people were, but... My brother was scared. I'm just going to put that out there. My brother was scared shitless. Well, even, like even like I say, even a guy like McFadden comes over, and like I say, you know, he he presses pretty hard in a race car, you know, and, and uh, even he comes over and says, you know, just, you can, oh my gosh, you know, like, he's one of the first guys that even comes up to say anything. Like, nobody else is even saying nothing, because obviously they don't want to admit that maybe they're a little nervous about, about what we're doing or anything. But, uh, but no, so going in, like when we, when we won the heat race, like I say, Gio was on the outside, we got a good start, drove into one and we, we, you know, we won the heat, uh, obviously about as easy of a heat to win once you get out going, but we've only went four laps at a time or two laps. We're rolling eight laps. Eight laps around Bristol feels like a long time. Like it just does because like like you say, you try to hit your mark into one eight laps in a row, ain't gonna happen. Especially like the first night. I feel like the only guy that really had control of his race car the first night was Gravel. Clearly his car looked better than everybody's the first night. Looked like he had more control than everybody the first night. Um just yeah, like I say, he just looked more comfortable than everybody else. And uh, so we run the dash, and I know, like, I got to get a jump because Gravel's got a Morrison, and he's going to stroke us into turn one if I, you know, if I don't get a jump. So I think I even got into, I even got into one better and everything, but he still, he still won the dash. Um, we start front row outside of the feature, and honestly, we we're pretty decent to start, but still unknown you know uh we don't know what to do to our race car never been there you know never really and honestly we're pretty new to the 410 scene at this time because we hadn't really been running it so you know coming from 360s rolling right into this like i mean i you know it's not like i'm stupid or anything but the things we needed to do to the race car i couldn't tell you because i just didn't know and we didn't make a lot of changes the first night and we, we ended up running fourth um Faded back there, you know, I wouldn't say we faded, but, you know, there was just guys that were better. Like, Reitzel was running a line like a lot of guys weren't going to run. You know, he was up on the fence pretty hard compared to most guys. He got by us, and then I think Macedo was kind of doing some of the same stuff, and he got by us as well. But uh, other than that, we were we were a solid race car. And, uh, I mean, I, I was tickled with running fourth my first night at Bristol for sure. So you alluded to it earlier. A lot of people were implying that everyone was going to have to have like all this crap made for their cars and stuff like that. You actually did very little. Could you explain what you did to prepare for that race? Well, like I would say the only things that we did was the first thing I know for sure 
And I kind of left it up to the guys, like, because I honestly was going to go there and not do anything. I was. Like, I I felt like our stuff was pretty solid. Like, I wasn't uh, – because I was on a kick, like, a year before we built a couple of cars that were super, super light, and I saw what they could withstand, and I really wasn't worried about the car. So we uh, – we actually, I wasn't going to do anything. And then the guy's like, man, let's get a little heavier hub on it. So we went and got, you know, we went and got, uh, instead of like the lightweight, uh, DMI Tetris hubs, we got a, we got the standard weight stuff, no pocket, you know, they weren't pocketed out. Um, the guys wanted to put steel radius rods with steel rod ends on the front end. So we did that on all, you know, all three front radius rods. Uh, we ran beadlock fronts. You know, obviously that's not way out of the ordinary, but we ran beadlock fronts, um, wings. We didn't do anything. And a lot of guys had like five supports on the left side, which was really common. Uh, most guys had special built wings for there. We didn't change any dimension of our wing at all. We didn't change board placement. We didn't change anything. Uh, we still had like a standard lead on the left side, like nothing crazy. We didn't do anything there. Uh, wing height, everything relatively stayed the same. Um, after the first night, though, we did between the second and third support on the left side, we did have the board, the left side board buckle in. So I added a fist strap right in the middle. But other than that, that that was the extent of our race car. We didn't change much at all. So after night one, Gravel had an elite car, and you got passed by the two psychopaths that were willing to run the top. What changes did you guys make going into night number two to get faster? So, you know, I've been big on running long radius rods anyway for, you know, like we even ran them in 360s a little bit here and there. And uh, I kind of knew what it would do to the race car. Um, I knew we had to make some pretty good changes to be better. And uh, I actually, I even slowed my steering down a little bit more just to kind of smooth you out some. Like I don't, I don't care how smooth a race car driver you are. I don't think you could slow the steering down enough for a guy at a place like that. I thought that was a huge advantage just doing that. Um, And we went, like I say, we went the longer radius rods. Um, I honestly, we tried the four quarter deal. We tried all that. Like I, I think we still stayed pretty basic on our setup there. Um, I think I ended up like quarters down to right, 15s down to left is what we ended up doing. Um, nothing too crazy, you know, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Um, and like I say, we just, air pressure was huge for us there. I think that was something that, uh, honestly, yeah, you know, I give a lot of credit to like Stephen Ham Riley on the deal. Like he, you know, he was, he was pretty big in our tire deal at that time. So I think he helped us run some stuff that I would never think about running air pressure wise, but he, but he helped out a bunch in that category because I felt like he had a better feel for it than I would have. Cause we really hadn't been running four ten stuff, like I say. So, uh, kind of let him kind of control that stuff. And, and, uh, I felt like he got us in the ballpark there tire wise for sure. Hot lap starts the next day and immediately it's pretty obvious that the two fastest cars are Geo Selzy and Sam Hayfertip Jr. At this point, Dom, what are you thinking? Well, like, for me, obviously watching it, I'm scared shitless watching it, knowing how my brother felt the first night. And, you know, he really never got comfortable that first night. He, he never felt like he was, uh, uh, hang on. Ladies, can we be quiet? So my, my brother was uncomfortable from the get-go. All weekend long, he was uncomfortable. And, you know... He, he, he never really got comfortable that whole weekend, but he has speed on half miles like nobody I know. He can just go to a big place, be comfortable, be fast. And I remember talking to him that, that next morning after the first night, and he's like, man, I, I just don't feel comfortable around other race cars. Like he goes, I, I got somewhat comfortable in the heat race, just sort of following around, but I'm uncomfortable. The the air, he goes, it's tremendous what the air is doing. Like when you a guy crosses your path or anything like that, he's like, the, the air is just amazing. He's like, so I just, I didn't know, he didn't know what to do. And like our kind of conversation kind of went, he had a game plan of where they needed to go. It, it kind of seemed similar to what Sam's saying. He's like, as the racetrack 
is faster in the beginning of the night, you know, we need to just make sure, you know, we're basically hitting on all eight cylinders. We're running as hard as we can and as straight as we can. But as the racetrack slows down, he said that they were thinking they probably needed to go back closer to like what they would do at an Eldora or a Volusia where, you know, yes, it's still incredibly fast, but you know, we need to get the car back normal feeling uh, when we are in traffic. And that's what he did the second night. And, and he actually ran a lot better the second night. So Gio goes out and sets the standard early. What are you thinking at this point, Dom? I'm thinking, holy shit. I, Cause I think that was the track record at the time, right? Yeah. I, I'm thinking, holy shit. Like if he has the track record at Bristol, that's, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, and we kind of knew at that point, if it gets set, it's going to be very hard for someone to beat it. There's only going to be a select few guys that can beat it, you know, like a gravel or, you know, a, a Jason Johnson racing guys with, with Carson. You know, honestly, Sam, like I didn't even, I knew you were a good qualifier and fast, but I didn't expect you to break the track record. I, I kind of thought once we got to that part of qualifying, hey, my brother's probably going to end up with a new track record. So Sam, at that point, you'd been fastest in hot laps. When Gio had laid his lap, because I believe he was one of the first three to go, did you still think you had a chance at it? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I I never thought we didn't. Like, we – the one thing we really got everybody on is I took both wickers off. Nobody did that. You know, like, that was that was one of the things. And, honestly, we waited till the last second to do it. I didn't even – like, it was one of those, like, gravel noticed it like last second, you know, he, cause he even mentioned something like, Oh, well, you know, he felt like he would have had quick time if they would have took theirs off. You know what I'm saying? It was one of those type of deals. Um, so, and I don't even know one of the guys was asking me like, well, do you, have you ever qualified without a wicker bill on the top wing? I was like, no, but I said, dude, I don't know how the hell you would need it here. We've got so much downforce and we're so stuck that, just take it off, you know, and then, you know, that I'm not going to say that's what propelled us to have quick time. Cause I think our hot lap time was still pretty quick, but, um, I didn't, I never thought it was like out of reach, but I also wasn't going, man, I got to get the track record at Bristol either. I was just, you know, I was, I knew we were fast and I knew it was going to put us in a good spot. No matter what happened, I knew, okay, we're going to be on the front row of the heat race. Cause that's all that matters. Like if we got into the dash and we got good enough to draw a one or a, you know, then we're up front and, you know, at that point, the the gains we'd already made on a race car, I'm like, man, we're so fast. I don't know, if, even if it gets slick, these guys are going to be able to drive around us. Our, our stuff was operating that good. So could you take us through the two laps in your mind? So going in to turn one on the first lap, you know, like I say, it's, it's a real touchy deal. Like you go in there and you're trying to hit your mark and you're trying to stay, you know, straight and you're trying to do everything right. But like, there was like a little hump cause we got, a, we got rain that night before there was like a hump getting into one and everybody seemed to really struggle with it. And our car just kind of floated over the hump and just rolled right around there. It was really nice. Um, and I just remember that like you, I know some guys would come try to get like tight to the bottom, like on their laps. And I thought that like when they did that, I thought, you know, we're at Bristol. Like I envisioned driving it like an Indy car. Like I envisioned it like back in my go-kart driving days when I raced carts, like flat carts, dirt carts. When I, when I used to run that, it was like, you just run a huge and, you know, hit the apex at the bottom and, and drive off straight, you know, make it, make a big, you know, make a big long arc and straighten the corner out as quick as you can on the exit to make all that shoot speed. And, uh, I knew our motors were running good at that time. Like I still didn't think we had what like geo and gravel had, but I knew our stuff was good enough. If we got our car right, like we would be good. And like going into three, I kind of let the car do what it wanted. And I usually don't drive like that, but I kind of, I kind of let the car kind of go where it wanted to. And then on the second lap, I felt like I opened up a little more entry into one and kind of arced down a little harder than I did the, the first lap. Um, and I just remember trying to repeat that two laps in a row because like I say, it was just trying to drive it like a, like Indy cars drive their cars, you know, just, just trying to make a, you know, like open up the entry, you know, cut off the middle of the corner and, and just drive straight across to the exit. Like I was, I don't know if you if you watch the if you watch the video you can see like where I'm trying to use up everything off the exit 
to get all the way out to the wall to just so I can drive straight off the corner instead of cutting it off, you know, and I think that really made a lot of speed doing that. The man who was very quick in practice this afternoon on the clock now from Sunnyvale, Texas, the Town Line Variety High Raider Foundation Service Act Limited Insurance Kaiser Aluminum Wheels, number 15H of Sam Hafer Team Jr. Sam Hafer Team in the 15H, his opening lap time, quick time, and a new track record, 13 396, 13396, 141.356 miles per hour, second lap time. Faster yet, and we hit 142, a 13-326, 142.098 miles per hour for Sam. Now, Sam, I, that, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask that. Um, you know, <clears throat> me being a f- for sure 100% short track guy, um, you know, going to Eldora, going to Knoxville, going to these some of these bigger places that are high speed, um, you know, trying to explain to somebody what you're doing and qualifying off the corner, you're almost turning right to try and keep the left side board from dropping out and, and getting down. What was that like there? Was that something that you could even control? Could you try and keep it on the right side? Or were you just so fast that you were just basically at that point through the bars and on the stops? I wouldn't say you're on the stops. Like it's, it's definitely extreme, but like if you've been, if anybody's been to Williams Grove, like when you go off into turn one at Williams Grove, <laughs> there is not a place in the world that does that to a race car. Um, even Bristol wasn't like that. And because the bank, you know, like, you know, you're so flat on a straightaway at like Williams Grove that the car gets extreme, right? Well, like Bristol, you're so tilted that the car doesn't, you know, you're already so left. You don't feel like you're, you know, you don't feel like you're slammed so hard. You know, like I, I don't feel like it was like that. And the one thing about Bristol, though, that I would say catches your attention more than any other place, when you go into turn one, when the track's that fast, we're running, what, a 13-3 or whatever it was. When you're going into turn one, you are in the right sides. And I mean, I mean, like that right rear shock is an inch from being buried, you know, and the right front's just planted. Um No other track does that. Like, even when you're stuck like glue at Eldora and your shit's operating, your car doesn't do that. Like, it's, it was pretty impressive to feel that. It wasn't like, oh man, I'm rolled over the right front. Just your whole car is in the right sides. It's, it's really hard to explain. And it's, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'll ever feel that again unless I'm crashing, but, um, it was pretty impressive though. One thing that like several different drivers brought up to me when I had talked to him and asked about it was, you know, at the end of the weekend, the, the speed was still pretty tremendous. Um, but, you know, guys were starting to get, I would say, a little bit used to it. But one thing that nobody that I talked to was used to was when you, the yellow would come out and you would lift and you would roll on the brakes, how long it took the car to decelerate, which is that something that you, you felt too, that it, it took a long time to slow down? Yeah. Well, what, what I think what caught everybody off guard was the first night when we qualified. You qualify the first night. And okay, we well, guys are gonna come in the back gate. <laughs> you go to let off off a of turn two or whatever, and it, you got it. You're on them. Like you wouldn't think you'd have to be. You know, like when you when you qualify at Knoxville, you roll around three and four, you get in the gate pretty easily. But uh, for the most part, you know, you get in the gate pretty easily. You know, and and uh, I just remember, and I was like, turn, you know you're going down the back chute and you're turning down in you're like wow like i'm the only thing i can compare it to is like when i ran talladega in arca car you're going around there and you've got so much speed like you're coming to pit road like okay we're going to come this time well you you're trying to get down and you're like hey dude you gotta slow down you like you you don't realize how fast you're going and how much you've got to get woed up to get stopped like i that is Huge, like it's it's funny you say that because like I didn't really even think about that until you just brought it up. But yeah, that's what I would compare it to, like a NASCAR deal where you're running 200 miles an hour and then we got to hit 55. You know, it's it's pretty pretty impressive that those that you could get slowed down. You have to get slowed down as much as that is, and you wouldn't you don't feel like you have to, but when you're actually trying to exit the racetrack, it's it's a pretty hard task if you're not ready for it. You actually said you're going so quick at Talladega, you blew up or ran out of fuel, and you did the whole lap. 
Yeah, so we didn't even we weren't even at the start finish line. We blow up and we made a whole revolution, and I rolled right back onto pit road in the pit stall. That's nuts. So we get to the heat race now, and everything goes downhill from there. Can you take us through the heat? Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, shots is outside front row. We're on the pole. They're on their Fords, and everybody knows their Fords don't take off at this time. Like, they just they just haven't got them taken off, you know? So, you know, they're, obviously they're still doing a lot of testing, whatever the case. And when you're on a 5.0 gear, I mean, it really, it really, it really shows, like, who can take off and who can't. And, uh I, I mean, I give a lot of credit to Tommy Ryder. Like, it, we bought an engine from him, and, and we put all the, you know, we did we did a lot of the main fuel fuel settings like he would normally do, and I mean, our stuff just took off really good. For now, the acceleration begins in the green flag waves. Cars accelerate through turns one and two, but the caution flag will be displayed. No start the call from the World of Outlaws NOS Energy Drink Sprint Car Series officials. Pole sitter Sam Hafer Teep went early before they got to the stripe. He will move to the inside of row two. That'll put Tony Schultz on the pole, and it'll move Paul McMahon to the outside of the front row. So they call the jump. You know, we 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 take the green and you know, we're, Donnie's not playing games. Like he's, he wasn't playing games or like, Oh, you know, like some guys like, Oh, you know, fuck Donnie. And I'm like, no, Donnie, Donnie wasn't playing games. Like he, his car just didn't take off, you know? And I guess what made me the, the maddest about it is like, and I, you know, like I say, like me and Mike Hess are over it by now, but like, uh, I don't even think I actually called him any bad names, which is a good thing. But, um, I was upset because in the heat races there, everybody knows, like, okay, we get into turn one, the guy that's second down the front chute drops in behind the front guy, and they're both making the dash. It's not going to change the outcome for anybody. Whether if Donnie got the jump or didn't get the jump or whatever, because I didn't think what I did, like, I didn't think our takeoff was blatantly like, I didn't think it was a jump at all. Like I'll stand by that today until the day I die. But you know, like, like I say, even if I didn't jump and say, okay, I'll just let Donnie go. I'm still going to run second and I'm still going to, you know, cause I, I didn't care who won the, won the race into turn one is a heat race. It didn't matter. I know I'm going to run second or first. I'm on the pole. So I didn't really care. I wasn't trying to jump the start. I wasn't trying to do anything. He just took off so poorly, and we took off so good. I guess to Mike Hess, it looked like I blatantly jumped the start. And that's what pissed me off is because even Mike Hess knows, the guy that's been around as long as he has, even if Donnie got the jump, I'm still going to run second, and I'm going to be in the dash. And that's what, and that's what I tried to explain. Like I, you know, I get why he called what he called and how it looked to him in the tower. I get it. You know, I get it. But uh, I don't have to be happy about it, you know, and, and – Honestly, it ruined our whole night. Like, because I on it, I, that's the other thing. Like, like you were saying, Gio's been talking. He can't race around cars. I hadn't had to race around any cars to that point. I had not raced around one car the whole time. So then now we're starting. What well, I don't, I don't think anyone would have been able to do anything with a second row starting spot. Like there, there was no chance of anyone doing anything. Right. So then I start second row inside, and I'm like, man, guys are getting tight getting into one. I got one shot. So me, I pressed the envelope. I entered in probably as close to the guy in front of me as, like, I think anybody would have entered in, you know, trying to do that. And like I say, I hadn't raced around a car the whole time. And what I did, I showed right up the racetrack. Two more guys drive by me, and I get down. And we, we end up running fifth. And... uh I'm so pissed off. We just didn't start the feature. I mean, it was that simple. Cause I knew we came there for one reason. Like I, we weren't going to do nothing starting 15th in the field. We knew that, you know? So I was like, I'm not, I'm not, we didn't come here to do that. You know, we, and just by principle, cause the way I felt, I said, no, we're parking it. You know, like I, 
whether or not anybody cares if Sam Haverty starts the A main or not, it didn't matter. I wanted Mike Hess to know I was pissed off about it, and that was the way I chose to handle it, you know? I can tell you that Miles was actually in the suite with Carlton watching the race, I believe, or somehow they were together, and Miles said that was, like, one of the hardest times he's ever had trying to keep his shit together and not be outwardly angry. He was pissed off, angry, and furious, but he also didn't want to make an ass out of himself around the outlaw officials. It might not have been Carlton. He might have been with Carter or someone, but he was absolutely livid and trying to keep his uh, calm. But basically, that was the end of your uh, day right there. When you look back on it, how proud are you? What does it mean to you to have the Bristol track record? Yeah, I don't know. Like, it doesn't pay anything. I mean, it's cool. You see, you see, I don't think it'll ever get beat. I don't think they'll ever actually race there again, to be honest. And if they do, yeah, there'd, there'd have to be a lot of, uh, there'd have to be a lot of things that they do to the race cars to beef them up to go there again. To, I mean, I know they went back there. Enrico ran like a 13.5 or something, which was impressive. Um, but I don't, I just don't think they'll ever, because they'll, they're going to take more bank away to, to get the guys to go there. Like in our situation, best, best case, I mean, no matter what happened, even if the tracks were the same racetrack that Sammy Swindell had the track record on before, technology evolves. We were going to, somebody was going to beat the track record. And uh, I think we uh, even beat it on less banking than what they actually had when they raced. So uh, it was really cool, though. Like um, the experience in itself, like I said at the beginning, was uh, unmatched for me. Like it's probably one of the coolest things I've ever done in a sprint car. Just because, you know, it's there's not very many people can say they ever went that fast around a racetrack. And uh, and. A lot of guys didn't have enough balls to even go out there. So, like, for us, it's like, hey, dude, we, we went out there. Yeah, everybody asked people questions. of like, what do I need to do at Bristol or this or that? Like, we got we got information from some people, but um, the bars we ran were not bars that anybody else said to run. Like, the some of the air pressures we ran weren't air pressures that anybody else said to run. Like, we kind of did our own deal, and I was I was proud of that the most. Like, we did it with – long radius rods and different things that other guys don't run. Like we did it that way. And I thought, you know, and that was, that's some of my thinking. So, uh, that's, I get a lot of pride out of that. Like I would say I'm pretty prideful for it because you know, all these guys, they built a special wing. They built this, this motor. I think Rudine even had a special car. It looked like that they unloaded, like all these guys, they built special stuff to come here. And not to say we didn't build something special, but, you know, it wasn't like it was, it was our race car that I built that I thought was a really nice piece. And everybody there was trying to be the fastest and it's a one-off deal. Nobody has a lot of notes. And for us to come out of there, fastest guy, it's pretty awesome. Dom, do you have any general questions or anything else you want to ask? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I I never went to Bristol, and I'm I'm thankful for it because, you know, I, that was just crazy fast, and and I'm not the kind of guy to want to even <laughs> even touch a, a track that quick. But um, this year, earlier this year, I went to Salina, the High Banks, and it was locked down incredibly fast, and I actually think the uh, track record was broken. Um, but a lot of guys, Brad, that's the fastest I've ever been in a race car, and the most G-force I ever felt. But Brad and James McFadden both. Um, you know, got out of the cars and I asked them what they thought. And they both said, this is the closest I've ever felt to Bristol, not Bristol, but the closest I've ever felt to Bristol. Um, in, in your time racing at Salina, I know you've been there a million times. Did, what, were there any slim similarities or what were the similarities from a place like that to Bristol? Like for me, because I'm telling you that was the fastest I've ever been. And I know it was nothing close to Bristol. Yeah, I would say like back, I don't know what the track record ended up being, but we were second quick to Joey back in maybe 14, 2014 there. Uh, and I think track record was broken that night. So it probably was 
obviously is better than that. And we were ripping around there pretty good that night. I remember it was, it was pretty hammered down. Um, there was no passing in the feature, but I would say, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it compares at all. Like, uh, I remember the place pretty distinctly cause that's where I shattered my arm. So, uh, I wouldn't think, uh, I don't know. I know the bankings there and I know stuff like that, but that shoot speed at Bristol and then coming into that hairpin, I, there's, I, I always tell people most extreme, most extreme, one of the most extreme tracks is just, obviously it's not nowhere near Bristol, but Williams Grove is extreme to me just because of how it gets the car so twisted up going into turn one. Like there's no other place that does that, you know? So I compare like you just put a lot of banking at, at Williams Grove and see you know, that's, that's what it feels like to me. Like that's, that's my biggest comparison is what I would say. So you felt like Bristol raced a lot like a, a paperclip and not as sweeping as, you know, let's say an Eldora or a Knoxville. Yeah. Not sweeping at all. Like, it's amazing to you when you go into turn three that it holds you as good as it does. And the only reason it does is because you're so down on the bump. Like it just, it buries your left rear tire in. And then you get in the G's of the car, plants the right side so hard that you you just, you can't slip a tire. You know, even when it's like, if it's slick, you're still almost wide open. Like you, you know, like, you know, like say Knoxville. Yeah, I always like, like, you know, like a, if you're qualifying in Knoxville and say it's around the top, you're not, you're not full on the throttle. Like that's what people don't understand. Like down the chutes, because they get the track so hard down the straightaways, you know, you're, you're rolled out some, like you're not just buried in. I mean, I'm sure some guys are obviously, but like guys that are consistently good, they're not just pegging the throttle. Like they're, they're, you know, they're doing a systematic approach with their qualifying lap and, and trying to keep the tires underneath them as well and trying to keep as much as much throttle. But I would say at Bristol, that's as close to not ever letting off as you ever get. Like you don't you don't ever roll like I know like at Knoxville you come off a come off a two, say you ride the curb all the way out to the fence and then it gets slicked down the back shoot. Well you might kind of roll up a little bit to keep your tires under and then you roll back in. Like you don't do that at Bristol. Like you're just in. Right. So you're not, you're not having to worry about catching the tire back up. You're just basically going with the grip that the bank and the wing speed is giving you. Right. Right. Real similar to Chico. I bet. (laughs) The one, the one, the one thing I did want to say that I haven't said, and I don't know if it's even, okay to say it but i don't care um carlton called me like a week or two after that whole deal and he was asking me he goes well what did you think sam and i said i had an awesome time coolest coolest thing i've ever done in a sprint car you know i said but uh i don't think i'd ever go back and he goes well what do you mean I said, well, like the rear end we took out, rear end was brand new. The rear end we took out, like the bird cage spacer on the left rear and the inner, the inner spacer that goes over the splines. Just the ring dug a, a groove into the axle, like just from the two nights of racing there. Like, and I'm like, I call Dave Ely like it's not a it's not a pro it's not their failure like it's nothing to do with them it's these cars are that hard on the splines where the wheels were riding were wore like a rear end that we'd ran ten or fifteen nights like I sent the rear end back and got a new axle put in it like it was that and I don't know what other guys did but and maybe maybe you could have ran it longer but I wasn't prepared to do that so and I told Carlton about what I had saw and what I thought. And I said, I would never take nothing else back there. And that was why, like, I mean, I, you break an axle at that place. You might as well just go ahead and dig you a six foot hole. Like, because that wall's not going to forgive you. Like a guy can't slow down. If you flip down the bank, like he's going to KO you. And all Carlton said was, I wish we would have had something where we had something break, but nobody got hurt. That way we wouldn't have to go back. 
that you know that's coming from Carlton. Like he knew what we were doing was. I mean, I'll tell you right now, it was a money grab for 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 everybody. Like you know, it was a money grab, but it was still cool. Like I don't blame him for doing it. I think it's badass that we did it, but at the end of the day, they made a shit ton of money that weekend because it's Bristol, you know, like, so, uh, but they're smart enough now. Like they know they're probably not ever going to do it again. You know, like, and the reason why this, the next time they went back, what they have 21 cars or 18 cars or something like that's, that's your proof right there that we don't need to be going around there. Anything else, Dom? No, honestly, you answered everything even before I could get to it. You, you, if I felt like I was racing there, honestly, I mean, it's incredible to hear your insight. And then, you know, obviously with my brothers and several of, of the other guys that I've talked to, the similarities of the concerns and, and what they thought, you know, I mean, the majority of the guys that I talked to about it, they all said the same thing, that it was incredibly unique, but um, just unsettling and, uh, you know, something that nobody really cared to do a second time. I think the only guy that I heard was like, yeah, it wasn't too bad. was was like Reitzel. That was the only guy that I felt like, uh, you know, he, he was like, ah, yeah, it wasn't bad. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, Aaron, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you're always wide open. So it didn't even affect him. But um, no, I, I, it's incredible that just to hear the story of going fast time with a new track record there and, and something that I don't think in our lifetime we'll see broken. I don't think we'll ever see dirt sprint cars go back there. And, and I don't think that they should. I think that should be something that gets retired. And they've done it now four times. And I think that's, uh, you know, four times is enough. Well, thanks a lot, fellas, and uh, thanks a lot for doing this, Sam. Thanks a lot for doing this, Dom. Thanks, guys. Next time, though, I think they should put ice on Eldora. That's the next one I want to see. 